And welcome to the QCast. This is season four, episode four. And this is one of the best episodes of the year. It was last year. I hope it will be again this year. And this is our men's basketball preseason top 25 round table. And boy, do I have a star studded cast with me today. Uh, we did something similar almost a year, almost a year ago. Uh, we did it on, let's see, October 12th of 2022. And we're here on October 10th, 2023, as we record this. And uh, let me introduce this uh, crazy talented panel. First of all, we have Mr. Ryan Scott, who is an Around the Nation columnist for D3Hoops.com. Thank you, Ryan. We have Matt Snyder, who's a co-host of the D3 Datacast. Mike Rainiak, the GM and head coach of the We Are D3 TBT team, and he is playing with house money. Ryan Whitnable, who is the creator and organizer of the Great Lakes Invitational. Zach Snyder, the other co-host of the D3 Datacast. There's two people that that uh, that would that should be here that we want to be here that had conflicts. Uh, first, Mr. Dave McHugh, uh, the creator, the host, uh, the OG of Hoopsville, and uh, Dave uh, asked me to send along his regards to everyone. He's very excited about the season premiere of Hoopsville in early November. Uh, it will be Hoopsville season 21, which I'm calling Hoopsville is now of legal drinking age season. So uh, Dave will be with us, um, hopefully on the QCast down the road, and we will all be tuning in to Dave's show Hoopsville very soon. And our friend Akiva Poppers, um, that's a little more kind of a, a serious one. So with you know everything, all the horrendous things going on in Israel, literally as we speak, um, uh, Akiva has been pulled into some additional things uh, on campus. Um, I think some uh, are aware that Elliot Steinmetz uh, was was stuck in Israel. He was there when all this happened. I think he had been there over a week, and he got stuck. And uh, and and our guy Poppers has been helping out with some things on campus with everything going on. So our thoughts are with all of our friends in Israel. Uh, with everything going on uh, in the world, and uh, again, you're in our thoughts. So, guys, let's uh, let's jump into this. But let me first give a little disclaimer that we're doing this again really early, and when we actually vote in the in the poll, we will have this nice ballot of information that D3Hoops.com collects. Like we'll have rosters, and we'll know who's returning and who left. And in today's day and age, that is important information because in the absence of seeing a 2023-24 a roster and the, with the COVID year, you have no idea who's actually coming back. You don't know who's transferred in. Um, we may have seen it come across social media, but we don't have that. And we all we don't have rosters. I don't know what maybe our, would you say a quarter of the rosters are up for teams? Maybe. So uh, we're going to do our best. You may hear us reference things like they have almost everybody back as opposed to us like listing a bunch of names. So you're just going to have to roll with us. But, I, but I'm very confident that we will get this done and we'll do a great job with this. So uh, we're, we're, we're going to have a lot of fun with this. First of all, uh, let's keep it loose. I'd like to start with Mr. Mike Raniak uh, as I go around the room. And I'd like you guys to just talk about like it's almost basketball season. You know, we're here October 10th. I think we have games starting, what is it, the weekend of like November, is it November 8th, first game somewhere in there? Um, yep. Let's go around the room. Your thoughts on the upcoming season. Mike Raniak, kick us off. Yeah, I, I think one thing that, that comes to mind is not only, obviously, we're all going to probably talk about it, but like the effect of the COVID year and transfers and things like that coming into play. But also just from a, a sheer preparation viewpoint, this is like the first year where D3 coaches can get, I think it's eight practices with their team yeah. prior. So teams early on where, you know, the, that early part of the schedule where we're, they're kind of figuring it out, they're going to be a lot more polished than what we normally see, you know, typically, which is, which is going to be kind of cool to see and how that, I think we're going to get a fairly... Uh, sooner um, barometer reading 
of, of where teams are just because they are coming in well-prepared. Like I've talked with a lot of coaches, yeah. a lot of the stuff that you spend the first couple weeks with like all this, like housekeeping stuff, like locker room decor philosophy, you know, kind of what your identity is going to be at theme. That's a lot of it. It will be already hopefully solved. And then like, really you're already two weeks ahead of where you, where you normally would be. So like for me, that's going to be interesting to see how that effect takes place. I think it's great that the NCAA did that. Um, something that, you know, I think should have been a long time coming. Um, which is also like why NESCACs have been padding their early part of the schedules because of that late start before. But so hopefully maybe that doesn't happen as much, but I, I think it's going to be interesting to see that effect just from a sheer coaching viewpoint um, as we kind of start the 23, 24 season here. Great point. The, the season turned into uh, what days instead of weeks, which has allowed these extra practices. I think that will be a big factor. Ryan Scott, uh, you had a, a a busy early part of the offseason. You did a great job covering Dave Hickson's enshrinement into the Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame. I thought that was really cool. Um, but what are your thoughts, uh, Ryan Scott, as we head into another season here? Um, I think a lot of it is is the unknown, right? We've got our, our two finalists bringing back, we think, almost everybody. Um, but uh, missing a couple of maybe key pieces that that could change the dynamic. But after that, I mean, there are teams that bring a lot of the roster back, but not that a lot of them didn't finish the season the way that we thought they would. And that brings in a lot of questions. There are just, I mean, right down the list, so many teams that will be uh, competitive. The schedules are a lot tougher. You see a lot of these good teams playing each other a whole bunch throughout the season. Um, it's just going to be, be really interesting to see good basketball um you know uh bob you and those people like to project and predict and all of that are going to have a hard time because i think we're going to have so many losses we didn't expect we're going to have uh, a lot of games that are really competitive but uh if you're just there to watch the basketball it's going to be awesome yeah uh, awesome points and uh, this is a difficult year to assess on the front end we'll, we're going to talk about how deep the talent pool is as, as we go through this i think that will be one of the themes that emerges is this is nuts in terms of you know, the number of top 25 caliber teams that are out there coming in. Uh, Ryan Whitnable, um, you know, we got a, a few weeks before we get to that Great Lakes Invitational in Springfield, Ohio. I know you're excited about that. Another D3 hoop season. What are your thoughts coming in here? Well, Bob, thanks first uh, for, for having me. And it's good uh, good to see everyone again. I think the last time we were all together was, or most of us was Fort Wayne. So it, it's good to be Turning the calendar here to October and, and talking hoops again, um, echoing you know the the guys before me's thoughts. I think when we sat here doing the same podcast a year ago, we talked about a lot of deep, experienced teams. We talked about a lot of parity, and, and I think a lot of those similar themes continue this year. I think in years past, there's been a couple of teams we've honed in on to start the year that we really like, and we're probably about to talk about some of those teams. Um, but, you know, with the transfer portal and the fifth year rule continuing again this year, we're just not seeing teams reload like they have in the past. You know, a lot of teams we've seen add deep experience, talented pieces to their rosters, um, you know, fifth year guys, transfer portal guys. And we're seeing that theme continue this year. So I, I think there's a, an elite tier of teams that we're probably about, again, to talk about in, in the next couple of segments. But I think there's a giant second bucket of teams again this yeah. year that are sitting just behind that first tier that we're all trying to figure out and, and kind of read the tea leaves on a little bit. I'll, I'd also add there's there's a third tier that goes down to maybe 50 this year where you could make a case that it's a top 25 team normally might not be this year. Um, so let's get, kind of see how the conversation plays out. Uh, Zach Snyder, great work on the data cast. You guys have been cranking it out. Um, you have to be excited. Uh, obviously, you and Matt being Calvin grads, it's probably a team we're about to talk about in a little bit. But what are, what are your thoughts coming in here, Zach? Yeah, I'm excited just for I, I, the number of teams that we – it sounds like a lot of us expect will be good and how many good matchups we'll be getting. Um, you know, last season as Matt and I were just sort of ramping up and trying to figure out what the D3 data cast was going to be. One of our early episodes leading into the season was like the top 50 games of November. And uh, it 
seems like, like we stumbled onto a winner of a, of a topic there. So we're going to do that again for this season. We've started putting together some of those, those games and I was taking a first run through it. And Matt, I think I like, I got to like 30 games and I was only in the first week still. So we had to pick, like be really selective in terms of what's even going to make that list just because right out of the gate, we're getting so many really good games between, you know, like probably two uh, top 25, top 50 um, type teams. So there's going to be some matchups even in that first month that are between really good teams that just won't even make that list because we're just seeing so many, uh, I think, teams that are going to be relevant in terms of top 25 voting. And um, we're going to be able to see a lot of them playing each other, which is great. Yeah, no, no question about it, Zach. Uh, totally agree. And uh, there are a, a bunch of great matchups and, and the, the scheduling has been awesome the last several years. This year, again, continues that trend. And Matt Snyder, uh, our other co-host of the D3 Datacast, uh, again, a Calvin guy that's got to feel awfully good about his team coming in. But your thoughts kind of on the big picture here, Matt, as we head into the season. Yeah, echoing a lot of the comments we've already heard. I think there's a lot of great teams this year. There's about 15 teams I want to put in the top five. There's about 35 teams I want to put in the top 25. I've just started my research. Um, I think we we talked last year about being a deep season across Division Three men's basketball. I think we're going to see that again. Um, we don't have maybe the team like Randolph Macon of two years ago who's going to go more or less wire to wire. I don't know that we have that team this year, but we have you know, 20, 25 teams that could have an argument to make it to Fort Wayne this year. And I think that's going to be tremendously exciting to watch. Great points. And just on on my end of that, before we get going, I would just say, again, it's the, uh, I think what people are going to realize when they see the top 25 ballot or the top 25 poll come out, whenever that is, it's going to be incredibly hard to get into it. Because the, 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 the amount of talent, like I'm thinking about uh, my alma mater, they have a point guard back who started five division one games last year. Uh, I think they're going to go about six, four, six, five, six, eight, six, ten behind him. And, and I don't think they'll sniff a single top 25 preseason uh, vote because they're just not, they're not in the, there's too many other teams that are locks. And, and so you're, I think that will be the theme as we start to see uh, some of the ballots come out. Is it the bar to get into someone's ballot is is crazy yeah. this year? So let's, uh, with that in mind, let me kind of go around the room. And uh, the safest way in this setting, without all the information, for me to kind of get some teams on the table, I asked all these guys to come with a couple teams that fall into this question. Um, give me one team that you feel great about in your preseason top ten ballot. And we're going to go around once. We may even do a second round. Um, so let me go in reverse order. Let's start with uh, Matt Snyder. Give me a team that's that's pretty much for sure in your top 10. And give me a little sound by that why, why they're in that position. Okay, I'll, I'll leave maybe the easy one on the board. Um, I'm going to go with Oswego State. Um, I was, I was, I'm high on Oswego state. They were really good last year. I think they finished number three in my efficiency ratings. They were probably number five in the D three hoops.com top 25 poll. So I'm not going off the board. I think they returned four starters, um, including Jeremiah Sparks was their leading scorer last year. They've got a couple guys back for, uh, for grad years. Um, I think they lose maybe one senior Devin green, second leading scorer. I think the rest is back. I think they were a great team last year. I think they're going to be a great team this year. Uh, I feel really good about them being in the top five, top 10 of my ballot. And what I will say is so far, uh, our friend Poppers agrees. Folks, in a text, I have Poppers ballot with color codes, and he agrees with you. Oswego State <laughs> is a top 10 team. Shout out to Poppers. Um, I'm just going to go in kind of no particular order. How about Ryan Scott? Ryan Scott, give us a top 10 team. I'll take the easy one. Um, I think the defending champions, Christopher Newport, uh, no a pretty way. solid top 10 team here. Oh, man. Uh, they do have I'll a roster them. up. And so we are aware that they're bringing back, I think, all but two of the guys uh, from that roster and adding um, some interesting pieces as well. Um, it's it's the gimme, but uh, I'm going to take it. And, and CNU uh, should be, I would expect, number one and definitely in the top 10 of every ballot. You heard it here first, folks. The team that cut down the nets last year and returns their whole team, basically, is a top 10 team. And Poppers agrees. 
Poppers has CNU ranked. I can't, I can't release this. He has them ranked very highly in his ballot. <laughs> so Poppers agrees with Ryan Scott. Okay. So far, we're rolling. Uh, Mike Rainiac, who is uh, another season with the toothpick, very impressive. Uh, give us a top ten team, Mike. Uh, this is, by the way, apple cinnamon flavor for the fall. Nice. Um, but uh, uh, I'm gonna go with Keen State. I Ooh. feel pretty pretty comfortable with them with the kid Hunter coming back, Brito. Um, even with the coaching change, like he's Coach Hastings has been around the program for a while. Um, just kind of knowing the league and kind of what their schedule looks like. I feel pretty comfortable with them. Um, and as we go stage, just to touch on um, prior, like that's the type of team that typically not only um, reloads, but they add a lot of talent from transfers, whether yeah. it be off of community colleges or whether it be off of other, you know, D2 programs. Um, th there's going to be, I bet you maybe one or two players on that team that just fuels that fire, but I'm going to go with, my team, Keene State, I have a feeling um, I'm pretty comfortable with them in the top 10 preseason. Um, I agree with you, by the way. No concern, top 10, uh, coaching change. We all good on uh, coaching change? Yeah, I mean, I you always have some questions about that, right? Um, but those guys are really good, and I believe they're bringing back literally everybody. Um, and they went out with a really sour note. I was at that game yeah. uh, down at Swarthmore and they were sick all week and, uh, you know, just didn't play at the level that they were capable of playing. And, you know, like, I mean, I just say, I was in the lobby as they were walking out and Jeff Hunter walked right up to me and looked me in the eye and he was like, we're not ending our careers this way. Like we're coming back and we're going to be, uh, we're going to be really good. I mean, he just was ready to do it. And I, I think they're, they're ready to go. And I'll tell you what, if you haven't watched Jeff Hunter play, check out Keene State this year. He is a six, seven, four, five guy that is an absolute beast. Um, he's a stud. Uh, by the way, Mike, Poppers, he says you're right. Poppers has Keene State in his top 10. I can sleep well tonight. Thank, yep. thank the Lord. I can't wait for the first, the first pick that is not on the Poppers list. Uh, that will be very exciting. Ryan Whitnable. Uh, here we go. We're rolling the dice to you. Who you got? Yeah, I, I think there's two teams from from my home conference, the OAC. You could you could possibly choose from, and I'll go with John Carroll. Um, those that don't remember, John Carroll brought in a number of D1 transfers in last year. Uh, Chaconi, Frazier, uh, all those guys came in as sophomores from an eligibility standpoint. So all that team comes back off of what I thought was a, a top ten team a year ago. Um, they had a real tough trip out to Oswego State the first weekend of the NCAA tournament, took a loss there. Um, but, you know, with that group having an entire year to gel together from a chemistry standpoint, they had a year together playing at the Division Three level. I think they'll take that next step up the ladder and be in that national championship conversation this year. They they are scary talented. Yeah, When I watched them last year, I had them in my top five most of the year just based on raw talent. They didn't always play like a top five team, but you got to figure another year uh, where they played together last year. They're, they're all coming back. I I don't know that there's a team with any more talent than John Carroll. So uh, again, this is just an example of like, they're not going to be, I, I doubt they're the number one team in the pre there, there's, there's a whole bunch of options you could pick there. So uh, that's a great one. And poppers locked it in four for four. Uh, we could have the streak broken here uh, with Zach Snyder. So, Zach, give us a top 10 team, and let's see if Poppers agrees. All right, so I guess the pressure's on. Um, all right, well, just to make sure I don't I don't fumble this, I'm going to go with my safer pick that oh, I boy. have left here, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick in the OAC and uh, take Mount Union. Um, I think, you know, they're they're another one of these final four teams we saw from a year ago that is, seems to be rolling it right back. Um, and so I, I think they're at the top of the OAC. You've got two national championship contenders. Uh, Poppers loves your pick. Uh, he's all over that. Um, can anyone remind me with the Mount? Uh, did did they lose anybody from? They lost somebody. Who who did they lose? Mansfield from last year? for sure is gone. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I think Mansfield, Mansfield was was definitely the one. Uh, okay. Braden Pool maybe. Gotcha. Okay. 
but they're still, I mean, incredibly loaded. And, and so this is another example of like, like uh, Ryan's uh, Ryan Whitnable's Marietta club, a uh, very talented team that has no chance to be picked any higher in their own conference than third. And I'm not sure what Heidelberg brings back, but it could be fourth. And that's just an example of like a great team. Many years could be a top 25 team, probably has zero chance in the preseason. Um, if Poppers was here, I'm going to, I'm going to go with his highest rated team. And Poppers would tell us right now that Miles Barnstable and the UWW Warhawks are a very safe top 10 team. I think we were all impressed by how Whitewater finished last year, how they played in Fort Wayne. And I think our guy Akiva is all over that. Now, guys, I only asked the, the, these uh, panelists for one of these teams, but I think they all wrote down a couple and so they get to pass. If I call on them a second time and they don't really have one ready, they get to pass. But I suspect there might be a few more we could get out here. So um, Ryan Whitnabel, what do you got for a second go at a uh, super safe or a probable top 10? I'm going to have to pass, Bob. I think the six that we discussed, including Whitewater, were the six that I wrote down as well. I think That's we're all in agreement. That's kind of where your line is. Okay, yeah. okay, I, I got you. That's very fair. How about uh, Mike we should, before we Before we move on, Bob, we, we should mention Whitewater also has a coaching coaching change that will probably be more of an impact given how young those guys are. Great point. Um, Great point. Some with, questions anyway. Yep, Coach Miller moving on. There, that will be uh, that'll be very interesting to see how that young group gels with a new coach. Great point. Mike Raniak, do you have another probable top 10? I could maybe go with Case. I'm, I'm maybe gonna go with Case Western. Um, just because just been their identity the last couple of years, where it's kind of like, hey. You want to come aboard, come on for one year and we'll ship you off and, you know, onto the, you'll get a great degree and all that good stuff. Um, I think they're starting to kind of really figure out the scheduling piece. Um, but obviously like they're accustomed to this almost um, it's not transient culture because like, you know, McGinnis, um, you know, does, um, you know, recruit obviously for your players. I'm just thinking like the new add-ons they're they've, they've grown to, kind of embrace the the kind of the island of misfit toys and they put out a really good brand of basketball you know especially you know in the uaa which is going to be difficult so they're going to be tested on early on but i think um they would be more towards the bottom of my top 10 you know probably 10th but that's just one that that kind of pops out to me hopper says you are absolutely correct he loves the spartans of case western reserve university um they have an incredible number of high level transfers guys that have been absolute studs at other places. I, I think it's challenging to just throw all those guys in the melting pot and just see how it, but, but, but it's been working. I, I don't think I've seen this many transfers mm -hmm. all meshed together, um, but they are incredibly talented and does. Uh, and, and poppers loves the pick. I feel like we're playing Russian roulette with poppers. This is going to be, yeah. this is going to be difficult. This is a, I think, I think Ryan, you took a, you took the easy way out. This is like, we got to keep going. This is unbelievable. Um, Matt Snyder, do you have another top 10 team? Yeah. I might be surprised if this is on the, the poppers master list here, but give me Hampton Sydney in the top 10. Oh, he's got um, them 11. He's got them oh, 11. This wow. is unbelievable. Pop, how, um, how much time has the guy spent on this ballot? It's a crazy good ballot. I, I believe Hampton Sydney had four of their five starters be juniors last year. I think they're all back. The fifth, uh, Ryan Clements, Clements, I think he's back for a fifth year. So I think they're returning all of their starters. I think they had four seniors on the roster. I think three are back. If I saw the roster correctly, I did a quick calculation. 99% of their points in minutes returning um, in my efficiency ratings. They finished number 10. I think they were in the top 20 of the D three hoops.com poll. I think Hampton Sydney is going to have a really great year. I think they're going to be competing at the top of a really strong league. And I would not be surprised to find them in the top 10 uh, either to start the year or to finish the year. That's the first one, not in the poppers top 10, but it was number 11, which is pretty crazy um ryan scott i can't remember did i do you a second time do you have another pick for us well i don't know if this is gonna be on the poppers list either um 
I, given the teams that we have available, I'm pretty confident that I, I will have Swarthmore in my top 10. Um, looked at the roster to double check today. They've got Vinny D'Angelo, the point guard back, and Michael Caprice, the big guy who really improved last year, super strong down the stretch. Given the track record they have, the team ball they play, uh, I don't know that that's a gimme for the top 10, but I think that's a very safe pick. Poppers has them on his review list. He has them color-coded yellow, which means he needs to click on the roster and examine more information. I think he's waiting for the preseason ballot. Uh, Poppers likes Swarthmore, but he needs more time. I think that's a great pick. It's hard for me to believe that they're not going to be right in that conversation again. Um, and finally, Mr. Zach Snyder, Zach, um, there's, there's a, I think a super obvious one, uh, uh, really that would be easy for you to come up with, but, uh, what do you got for us, Zach? That's a leading question here. I will say that my list has been exhausted at this point. Uh, you said, uh, in our, your prompt to us, it was, uh, some teams that we felt great about being okay. a, a preseason top 10. And I would say, uh, my felt great about only went about seven deep. Well, I'm just going to uh, answer the, the question. That is, so we have two guys that graduated from Calvin. I, I don't see how Calvin's not in, in, in my top 10. Certainly my guy poppers agrees. Calvin returns uh, Jalen overway. Who's a six, nine monster who as a freshman just ate up the, the MIAA. Um, you've got uh Uchenna Agezi. Am I saying that Ag right, guys? Agakeza. Agakeza. And the whole, like, is most of the team back, Snyder's? Most of the team back, yes? Yeah, they lose one starter, uh, Eli Sensenig, who was uh, contributed on both ends of the ball, more of a defensive player. Um, so they lose him, but otherwise all the entire rotation is back, um, you know, plus some additions. Yeah, so I mean, I, I got to believe that, that Calvin, and I'm going to give you one more gem from the poppers list. Um, which which I would I would have for sure in my top ten, and that is New York University. Oh, yeah. If if there's there's a couple guys coming back that surprised me. Um, why can't I remember the stud? Savarino and yeah. Friedman. Yeah, Savarino, Coach K's Friedman. Uh, grandson, and then Friedman, the stud point Friedman. guard. They're back, and you know you never know about transfers until they roll in. But they have some transfers that when you add like size that, that are adding size to that equation. So I'm going to say that NYU would be uh, in the conversation as well. Um, that that was really good, guys. Like that was I mean, everyone did their homework on that stuff. I'll, I'll throw out one completely not it's certainly nowhere near Popper's list that, that I would say I'm thinking about. And that would be Redlands. So Redlands from the SCIAC. Remember, they kind of ended their season with what an upset. They got upset in the conference tournament and they didn't get in, right? Uh, so, sometimes I mix up all these years in my head, so I'm pretty sure that that happened. They return everybody from a team that uh, plays that Eric Bridgeland style, that relentless up-tempo pressure, high scoring. I believe that Redlands will will be in this top 10 conversation maybe not i probably wouldn't have them in there right off the bat but i think there's someone to watch and and ryan w they'll be at your great lakes invitational correct in november they will be there yes so they will be fun to watch um before we move on guys we're going to talk kind of sleepers next um we just talked about potential top 10 teams any anything else on potential top 10 before we move on to sleepers I, I don't know if anyone was keeping, keeping count, but we talked top 10 and what did we name? 11 or 12 teams? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's how it goes, right? <laughs> that's how a list works. If you try to come up with 10, you need about 12 or 13, Zach. Uh, Ryan Scott, you had something. Well, I don't know if you're just like intentionally steering us away from this, Bob, but it, it feels like if we're getting down to the Redlands area that we should also mention North Park, right? That, that uh, good team, a lot of guys coming back, some transfers coming in there as well. Um, seems, I mean, again, maybe not a gimme in the top 10, but certainly they're going to the, get some top the, 10 positioning. This is the big difference though. North park, I believe will probably be a top 10 team. Eventually I see a more 16, 17, 20, they lost two incredibly important pieces 
or is it three? The Boyd twins, right? Three. I think it's three guys. Yeah. Jordan Jalen and uh, Mark Jackson. Yeah. I mean, those, those three guys without them last year, they do not have that season. Now they talk about rolling in some talent. They are rolling in some, some really talented players, but I think the difference is Redlands has everyone back in North Park. It's like, who's going to replace those three incredibly valuable guys. I, I will vote for him, but probably lower, like 20-ish, somewhere in there. Um, let's keep it rolling here, guys. Um, the, the next question here, this is, this is probably the first part was easy. Now we get into kind of like sleepers. And the question for the panel is, what team that finished outside of the final top 25 last year could be a top 25 team this year? That's a pretty soft way of asking. I, I'm not asking like, for sure on your ballot, but give me someone that did not finish in the top 25 that you think this year at some point is probably a top 25 team. How about Ryan Whitnable kick us off on this one? Yeah. And at the risk of being called an OAC homer here, I'm going to stick in the OAC with Otterbein um, oh my. program like that, that's been up and coming for, for a couple of years now for, for those that remember you know, Otterbein really struggled for a while uh, here in the last decade, and Andy Winters came in and has really been building that program back from from its foundation. Really, um, kind of r- reminds me a little bit of of when John Vanderwall came into Marietta and, and and kind of built that Marietta program up. They've been showing improvement from year to year. Recruiting has really started to pick up the year, uh, pick back up uh, at Otterbein. Um, they had some really competitive contest in the OAC last year against those top two, three teams. Uh, you look at some of the, the the games against Mount Union and John Carroll and, and even Marietta and Heidelberg, they were pretty competitive and, and you, you felt like they were maybe just a, a little bit missing something uh, th- th- to push them over the top and getting some of those close losses to wins. They bring almost everyone back. Cam Evans is back. Um, Heckman and Hannah are back. And then you sprinkle in an All-American transfer, Jack Clement, or Jack Clement uh, from Ohio Wesleyan coming in this year. Oh, I think yeah. this is the year where maybe Otterbein kind of breaks through and 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 we have an 18-20 win Otterbein team this year to throw into the to the other OAC chaos. I knew I was missing a big piece to the Otterbein puzzle, and I completely forgot that Clement he originally committed to what John Carroll? Was John Carroll, the, yes. And then and then he ended up at Otterbein. So I forgot about that, but now I'm totally with you. And we're going to talk about the OAC in just a little bit. I'm interested, Ryan W., in your take on how you're going to order like the top four or or five in the OAC. That that league now becomes, it's always ridiculous. It's going to be even more ridiculous. So that's a great sleeper. Mike Raniak, who do you got for us in terms of a sleeper team this year? Well, I like to go real, real deep on my sleepers. All right. So like, this is a team that a year from now will be on the final top 25 ballot because of the run that they're going to have. And it's happened historically. And I'm going to go with Emmanuel college out of Boston. Oh my. All right. Explain this. Oh, I'll be happy to. Um, so we talk about kind of like, um, reading the tea leaves, right? We, Ryan talked about it, things like that. You can tell a lot about how a coach feels about their team with how they schedule. Typically Um, you're either going to sandbag for wins and you're going to schedule real, real low, or you're going to schedule really strong. Um, When schedules started popping up and, uh, and mind you, Emmanuel last year was 18 and nine. So nothing to sneeze at, you know, that's solid. But if you look at their new schedule that's coming up, um, they start out at Nichols, Bowdoin, Williams, Conn College, Tufts. They're basically doing the NESCAC tour. Um, They go out to California and play Claremont and Caltech. Um, Claremont's obviously a solid one. but And they play Johnson and Wales. They're in that GNAC conference. Every year we talk about a GNAC team making a deep run in the tournament. Every year. Um, I Obviously, St. Joseph's the last couple of years has been, you know, the yeah. the head and shoulders above. But Albertus Magnus, for year, for over the last decade, we've talked about how did this team from the GNAC go deep? You know, and really, I feel like they're at this stage where 
they could take that mantle place. They could take that because they have all their top scorers are back. They're a year older. I know they got some good recruits. This is now year three of the 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 coach. So you're starting to get your own kids in culture. Um, I feel like they could be in that conversation of the St. Joseph's, the Albertas. They beat Albertas last year. Um, I know they lost to St. Joseph's, you know, pretty handily, but I think they had some people out with injury and things like that. So I just have a feeling like definitely just because of kind of where their conference strength is and things like that. I think they've scheduled hard enough where I'm going to get, I'm going to know week one, whether or not they're probably, whether I'm right or I'm just stupid. Um, but I, I just feel like um, the way that the coaches schedule with everybody coming back, just the makeup of how the GNAC has performed in the NCAA tournament over the, like the last decade, I have a feeling we could be voting in them top 25 in that final poll. I'm not saying they're going to be in my poll, like right off the bat or anything like that. I'm just saying eventually I think maybe they could get there with their performance in the NCAA tournament once they get cred, but obviously they got to get there first, but I think they've set themselves up to schedule strong and with the returners, I that's my it. real dark horse. And that's, and that's why we like to have diversity of, uh, of thought and regions on this kind of program. And, and so that's an awesome one that I would have never come up with. And I look forward to watching Emmanuel as the season starts. And I will be texting you if they start 0 and 3. Um, Looking forward to it. But next year is that undefeated year they're going to have. So I guess we have to wait till <laughs> next year to send all the texts. Mike, thank yeah. you. That was a good one. Ryan Scott, uh, who's your sleeper? How, how deep do we want to go? I, I'm, I'm, you can go as deep as you want. I'm waffling. So I may, I'm, I'm go going to mention two because uh, I'm greedy, but Please I'm going to waffle a little. The easy one is Mary Washington finished 26th last year. They're really good. They're bringing back almost everybody. It's going to be very easy to go from 26 to 25 this year. Um, but one that I'm interested in um, is Penn State Harrisburg. Mm. Um, they're bringing back, and I forget his name right now. Let me see if I have it real quick. Um, they have Nate Curry, who was an all-region performer last year, but uh, Donye Baylor Carroll, who we might remember from a couple of seasons ago, putting on uh, a show in the NCAA tournament. Uh, he decided he was done with basketball last year and then decided he was not done with oh, basketball, wow. and he is back on the roster for this year. So that'll be a backcourt um, that's really, really good. And in their league, um, you know, they they a quick scoring backcourt like that should do really, really well. And um, I don't know if they're going to quite have the schedule to to be able to put on a show, but they should have a pretty nice record. And that helps with the top 25. Yeah. And that's the kind of thing where people aren't even remembering who's coming back like that. This is someone that didn't play. Um, that is a great sleeper pick. Penn State, Harrisburg, Mary Washington agree i mean they finished uh, right the top others receiving votes is that is that correct ryan they were like 26 so they to were speak. 26 I mean, yeah <laughs> so that one's I, i'm gonna bet that that's a super safe one um and then let's go to to matt snyder matt give us give us a sleeper um i don't know if it's a huge sleeper but i'll, I'll take catholic um they were not in the, in oh, the top 25 last that's year poppers popper i gotta just uh. pause for a second Poppers was so excited to pick Catholic as his sleeper that like he wanted me to have him go last. Like he, he wanted me to stack the deck. Um, so continue. I just had to tell you that like you just stole his sleeper. So please go ahead. I, I think they have a chance to be great this year. Um, it looks like they're returning their top nine guys in the rotation in terms of minutes. Like everyone is back. Uh, plus, I think they're getting a six, six grad student from Trinity, Texas, who's uh, on the Catholic roster this year. He was a double digit scorer at Trinity. Uh, I just think they have a lot of pieces returning. They were pretty good last year. I think they were flirting with the top 25 kind of in and out. Um, and I, I kind of see them as in this year and they have a chance at going on a great run. That is a good one. And poppers will be very disappointed that he didn't get a chance to call that. I was just about to bring that one up for him and Zach, give me your sleeper. Yeah, well, if we go back to the last top 25 poll of last year, like there's some pretty low hanging fruit here. I mean, there's three teams that got mentioned in the top 10 discussion here between NYU, Calvin and uh, Redlands that I had on my list that, um, you know, were 
weren't in at the end of the year last year. But in the spirit of uh, our friends here going a little bit deeper, I'll I'll go with my deepest uh, team I I picked here. And again, I don't I don't know that this is a preseason top twenty five, but one that can get some attention. Uh, and that's Saint Norbert. Uh, from about the second week of January on, they ran the table through to the second round of the NCAA tournament before uh, eventually losing, I think, a two-point game at Wheaton. Uh, and that included a first-round win over a really good Carlton team. And uh, I think of the players who played at least like 100 minutes last year, I think there was like 10 players on their roster last year who played at least 100 minutes, and they bring back like nine of them. So they'll be a very experienced team and a team that really seemed to find their footing in the second half last year, got a really good tournament win, and then was right there at the end with Wheaton. Yeah, that's a St. Norbert played great at the end of last year, and they, they looked really good against Wheaton in that game at King Arena in the tournament. So those are all awesome. Let me try to throw – let me throw out one of my own and try to figure out what Popper's pick would be based on his list. McAllister, McAllister from the MIAC. Um, now there's a little bit of an asterisk here that, that I've got some, I've gleaned some information. Shout out to DMAC that's not out there yet, and it's not going to be coming out there for me. But McAllister, we thought returned their whole roster from a 15 win team, but they've they've had a a, a season ending injury to one of those players that we all assumed would be coming back and playing a very important role. So uh, again, I'm not going to be the one to break that, but I'm still going to throw McAllister out there as a really good sleeper, but I think it is tempered all of a sudden. Um, Poppers, I, I'm going to say could take, remind me, I assume Williams finished in the top 25 last year, right? Yeah. Um, they were 23. 23. Yep. How about Hamilton? Hamilton did not, right? Nope. They were just out. Okay, so Poppers is going to go with Hamilton as his uh, sleeper team, uh, and again, he was he was all in on Catholic. He was even closer to Catholic being top ten than a sleeper, which is why he th he thought getting him in the sleeper round was a steal. Um, so, gentlemen, that is a great list of of sleepers. Now we've talked about several uh, leagues here. I want to zero in. There's seven conferences. I want to do a really really quick around the room and and I I kind of assigned a league to to everybody to specialize in. So we're going to go in, in no particular order. How about the ODAC? Ryan Scott um great league. Me? It keeps getting better. Um Ryan Scott tell us a little bit about how you see just maybe the the top of the ODAC this year. Well, um we already had mentioned Hamden Sydney I think is going to be preseason favorites for sure. Um, a really, really good team bringing back basically everybody. Um, and so when you've got track record and returners, um, that's pretty high up there. Um, we've seen over the last two seasons, Randolph Macon lose a lot of really good players. And so I think we're confident that they'll still be pretty good, but they're going to have to prove themselves this year for sure. I don't know that they're even like a solid number two, probably just because of the record. Um you got a few teams that are almost always near the top. Uh, Guilford, Lynchburg, Roanoke will all will all be competitive, I think. Uh, the one for me that's that's interesting to watch is is Washington and Lee. Um, it was a really strong team last year, bringing um, quite a bit back again. Um, they've got a good schedule set up. Um, as as Mike was saying, when you see that kind of schedule, you know the coach is, is pretty confident in what they've got there. And because we don't have like outside of Hamden Sydney, like a sure thing in that conference, I could see them, you know, they could be six, but they could be second. You know, I think I think they're really good. Um, and and like always, really deep league, um, you know, night to night, very, very difficult. Um, and so, you know, it, it'll be exciting, but it'll be different than it has been the last few years where Randolph Macon just sort of ran away with everything. Yeah. I, I don't think you're going to see that at all. Yeah, this is the most reloaded that that uh, the Yellow Jackets have been for a while. They keep returning a ton. So this year will be interesting and other teams are pushing them. Um, thank you, Ryan. Ryan Whitnable, you know, we assigned you the, the OAC. And during this broadcast, we've already mentioned John Carroll, Hiley, Nationally, Mount Union. You had Otterbein as a sleeper. I threw out, you know, how good Heidelberg's been lately. So, I mean, how do you assess the the OAC coming into uh, into the new year here? 
Yeah, I, th- I thought last year was maybe since since I've been following the league, the best the conference has been um, top to bottom since since I've started following the league. I think this year's better. Um, I, I think at the top, you've got two teams and there's a lot of discussion I, I've heard from from circles about John Carroll or Mount Union. And I've heard differing opinions on, on which way to go there. I think the difference between the two is is the loss of Jeffrey Mansfield to Mount Union. I think he was yeah. a big piece of, of what made them go or, or the, the you know the, the straw that stirred the drink a little bit for Mount Union last year. And I think that loss will be pretty impactful from him for them, despite the fact that they bring so many weapons back. John Carroll brings everyone back. Again, as I mentioned, another year of experience, another year of playing together. John Carroll will, will be my OAC favorite this year. I think Mount Union slots in right behind them. I think, you know, the one-two punch of those two are probably both top 10, top 15 teams. Where do you slot your beloved alma mater in that preseason poll, by the way? Yeah, I, I think Marietta is probably third in the OAC to start the year. Um, you know, last year, I think they they had 17 wins, which is a down year for Marietta. Six of those losses, though, were, were to the top three teams in the conference, Mount Union, John Carroll, and Heidelberg. Outside of that, they were pretty rock solid. Um, one, you know, they, they, they lose one player of, of, of note off of last year's team. I think this Marietta team is, is, is going to be a lot better than last year's team. I think they've got a lot more experience this year. And unfortunately, you know, with John Carroll and Mount Union being so good, third place preseason, uh, is probably where they're going to settle this year. But I think Marietta could have another strong year as yeah, well. That's, that sounds right. Um, Behind so, them, I, I I think you know Otterbein is going to be in that conversation as well in that second tier, and then Heidelberg. Heidelberg does lose a couple pieces off of last year's team. They do bring back Isaiah Young. Uh, he'll be a junior this year, and he's you know got to be one of the top two or three players in the league. So so they'll still be real strong. I think the top five again this year in the OAC are are all potential top twenty five teams at some point in the year. Yeah, this this is the, the OAC is very deep this year very very deep um there's been years where oac was you know a top six seven league but it just it didn't go all the way down to five like this or potentially beyond that so this is going to be a great year um let's talk about the nezcac mike raniac because until i mentioned hamilton as a sleeper i think somehow it's been very quiet on this show about the nezcac so tell us what we should expect near the top of that league this year yeah, I, I think overall, um, I think the conference is down as a group. Um, I, I think uh, I think the whole COVID thing, I think um, some legendary coaches, not just at Amherst, but also like Bowden and and Tufts, um, kind of there has been a changing of the guard and things along those lines. And I think graduations and things like that, It's I think overall it's down this year, but I think clear cut, um, I think for Williams, if they don't win the league, it's uh, they're viewing it. I feel like they're viewing their fans. They're you know, if they don't win the league, it's it's a bust because they return so much. They're so um, they got such great length across um, you know all positions. Like they might be you know hands down, you know when it comes to starting five, like the tallest in the country. Yeah. Um, so like, it's one of those things where the continuity, um, the talent, um, you know, I think they open with WPI. So that's gonna, that's gonna be interesting right off the bat. Um, I think when it comes to kind of like, um, two and three kind of waiting in the wings, I think Trinity, uh, is going to be a team that is going to kind of really step into the mold um, because they have a, a really good big in gold Callahan who kind of got overshadowed a lot um, because of Sobel um, from Middlebury. And, and I think like he'll be kind of stepping into the the wings of kind of potentially being a player of the year candidate. And then, you know, I think Middlebury, even with the loss of Sobel is going to be in that conversation of being a top three team um you know i feel like they they have some great players coming back it's just how much um does the sobel effect take over you know like how much were they because of him or can they kind of overcome that and it's tough to say especially with a big um because you know it's very easy to if you have your premier player be a ball handler with the ball always in their hands all the time then it's very tough in my experiences to overcome that 
But Biggs, you know, like when they have to, obviously he's very talented and I love the guy to death, but I the ball wasn't in his hands majority of the possession. It got to him and he did his business. But so like, I, I'm interested to see how Middlebury plays out. I think dark horse of the conference is going to be con college. I think they're going to take that next step um, with coach Sweeney. I think, um, you know, they, they play NYU, I think early on in December, you know, they were, uh, you know, above 500 last year and that, that it's been a long time coming um, for them, I, I think overall, just Con College has started to invest um, in their athletic programs more than than what I've seen, as evident by like the soccer team kind of winning the national title and so on and so forth. I think just kind of like this like new juice. Um, I think just typically the 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 teams like Amherst, like uh, their their schedule is and and. I, I love them to death, but their schedule is historically bad. It is like not good, you know, out of conference. Um, and that's just me just being straight up honest. Um, it's very tough when you're, you talk about reading the tea leaves when it comes to schedule, they're going to be probably rolling in. I hope 13 and 0, 14 and 0 going into conference play and we'll see how that plays out. So like, it's very tough to kind of read a, a team like an Amherst or Wesleyan um, Tufts, I think, will be in the mix too. But if I were to like, you know, gun to my head today, top three, I would say Williams, hands down. I think they're going to be probably top ten, you know, on my ballot. I think then Trinity and I think Middlebury are the ones that are going to be gathering votes. Whereas last year, if you remember, it was like which NESCAC team are we going to put higher each week, <laughs> you know, and then like who lost, and then we'd shift it around and like. Whatever. I think I voted for like half the half the darn like league last year in my top 25 when it all was said and done. So I think this year it's a little bit more compact just because the league overall is down. Um, but I think overall pretty safe bet is is Williams, uh, Trinity and Middlebury kind of really kind of being the being at the forefront of the NESCAC this year. I would also I'd, I'd have Williams. Uh, I assume they'll be in my top 25. I had a I had a very public struggle with Williams in my ballot last year. I I, I I had a hard time based on, I guess their schedule and and what I thought were a lack of like good wins, um, with where to put them. And um, but then you know the eye test most of the time told me they were really good. Um, so I, I think Williams for me would be clearly ahead of the NESCAC going in. Uh, Matt Snyder, how about the College Conference of Illinois and Wisconsin? Tell us about that fine league, if you would. I, I better tread lightly here and feel free to correct the record after I'm done anything I say. Uh, but the two teams I think I would pick at the top right now uh, are Carthage and North Park. Really, I'm not sure which way to go those two. I think right now I would lean Carthage, maybe just because I know that they're one of those teams that returns, I think, just about literally everyone, if if not literally everyone. Uh, they have a terrific player, I believe, Philip Bolotovic. Is that, am I saying if I say that correctly? Uh, I believe you got very close. He's a, he's a great player. Uh, they were they were third place in the CCIW last year. Uh, that, that's a great league. And, and bringing everyone back, I think they can build on that. And I think they're going to be one of the favorites. Uh, North Park has a team we've mentioned already today. They do lose the, those Boyd brothers, Marquise Jackson, three of their top five scorers. They have a lot to replace. They have a lot coming in. I think they're that top 25 team we talked about. If I would assign error bars to any team right now, I think North Park is a team that I would give large error bars to. I could see them like up around the top five. I could see them, you know, if something happens to not come together, then struggling at, in, to get into the top 25. Uh, but right now I would pick them up, you know, maybe even with Carthage in the CCIW. Uh, Wheaton, I think, was last year's champion. And I, again, I haven't seen all the rosters, but I think they lost a ton, like all, almost everything. Um, maybe I'm not correct yeah. there, but they're kind of a team that's yeah. lost so much that I'm not really considering them that high at this point uh, in, in, in my research. So I think Wheaton's kind of maybe in that second or third tier of the CCIW. Uh, but I also don't want to lose sight of Elmhurst. I think Elmhurst is a team that uh, um, Wesley Hooker's going to, Trin uh, no, not Trinity, uh, St. Thomas, Texas. Right. Um, but they return a lot of other pieces. I think Elmhurst has a, um, a chance to be pretty good. John Baines has a good thing going there at Elmhurst. Um, so I think maybe they would be in that second tier. I think Illinois Wesleyan finally gets a lot of things back after last year. 
they had transfers out of the program. They had injuries. Uh, I probably don't need to tell you any of this information, Bob, uh, right. but last year was a little bit of a struggle. I expect <laughs> them to be back, maybe not at the top of the conference. Um, although if they're the number two seed at the CCIW at the end of the season, you know, I wouldn't be shocked about that, but I, I probably wouldn't pick them right there. Uh, so I think, I mean, those kind of whatever I named four or five teams are kind of maybe the top half or so as I see the league. Uh, agree. I, I think Carthage and North park. I, I, I have Carthage. I, I, I just, I love everything they're bringing back and, and, and they're not losing a lot. They had a, a sensational freshman last year, Julian. I can't Julian something, he, but just this big kid that can fire threes and has the yeah. softest touch you've ever seen. They have a freshman named Ryan Johnson. Who's a six, seven kid that that's going to be on the floor and probably help him. So I, I like Carthage Wheaton. I haven't seen a roster and I haven't seen a press release on their in, incoming group. Like, I'm sure somewhere there's there's some kid that that was uh, first team all conference uh, from somewhere that's going to be on the run. Maybe two of them, but I have, I don't know who they are at this point. And so there's nothing out there on Wheaton. Elmhurst has a transfer who was like a first team all conference player from some other league. Can't remember. Maybe a couple of those guys. So there's again a lot of movement in the CCIW. But I agree with you, and I like Carthage as, as the pick there. Um, Zach Snyder, there's a, a league, I don't know if we, anyone's heard of it, called the Wisconsin Intercollegiate Athletic Conference. Fairly good little conference. Um, what do you say about the WIAC, Zach? Yeah, I mean, usually you're talking about the WIAC. You're talking about you know a few teams usually that are nationally relevant. So far in our discussion, I think only one has come up so far, right? And that's Great Whitewater. I think, yeah. I think Whitewater interest the season as as the favorite in that league and for good reason for all the reasons we've talked about here in terms of what it means for the top 25 poll um, and I went back to the national semifinal box score just to check they had eight players listed in that box score that saw the floor all eight of them will will return uh, and remember that they were up I believe it was 13 on Mount Union at the half so uh, loaded I, I think they're the clear favorite um, and then it's a little bit interesting because I'm not, a, I'm not really sure what to make of what's going to happen behind them. If we, if we put, if we're okay saying Whitewater is the clear favorite, and you know Oshkosh has a lot of talent to replace, um, a lot of playing time up for grabs. Uh, now that's a big problem, but also you know a program like uh, like Oshkosh, you expect that the guys coming in are going to be really good players too, right? So there's a little bit of unknown. We'll see how that comes together. I don't think we're talking about a huge drop for Oshkosh, but I don't. There, there's not a lot that I could say, oh, you know, they're only going to go to two or three. I don't know. Right. We'll have to see. Um, it's a little bit similar, I think, with lacrosse. You know, they have some production to replace. Uh, Austin Westra is returning there for a fifth year. So that kind of helps mitigate what they have to replace production wise. But yep. they have a coaching change. Uh, Kent Dernbach left uh, lacrosse to go to Stevens Point. Uh, also his lead assistant took the job at Ripon. So there's a major coaching change, yeah. you know, between head coach, assistant coach, Changing over there, uh, JT Gritzmacher takes over. Quick plug for QCast Season 3, Episode 38. It was great to get to know JT a little bit. Uh, another fine QCast episode. Um, right, so, I mean, you got a coaching change. You got some production to make up for. Not sure what to make of lacrosse. Interesting, we get... Uh, I'm going to I'm going to peg Platteville as the team that is going to move back into the top half of the league. They finished sure. fifth out of the eight team WIAC last year. We talk about Oshkosh and lacrosse being in kind of a transition year this year. That was Platteville last year. They, you know, two years ago, they had a really veteran team. Uh, last year was, you know, trying to replace that production. Now they're back into a mode where they're bringing a lot of, uh, a lot of, they have a lot of returners coming back. So I look for them to move back into the top um, half of the league. I don't think that they necessarily challenge Whitewater, but, it, you know, maybe that's all the way up back up to number two. Um, and then, you know, the wild card for me here is Eau Claire. They had uh, a lot of seniors, but they also had a really big junior class. And, uh, you know, we didn't really talk about Eau Claire a whole lot, but they were not really that far off the fringe from kind of that, you know, lacrosse, uh, you know, line in the WIAC. So they're kind of the wild card. I, I, I don't, you know, there, there are a lot of losses in terms of their roster, but again, that junior class coming back that I think that's a big deal too. So I, they're, they're the wild card in the WIAC picture to me. That's uh, very well done. I think WIAC or, or uh, UWW Whitewater is clearly the, the favorite after that. I mean, I, 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 
I, I think Kent Dernbach is a great coach and, and I'm looking at like Steven's point, you know, like uh, I, I think he's got some guys that have come in there already. Um, so YX going to be crazy as usual. It'll be one of the best leagues as usual. Two more leagues we're going to touch on. I'm going to uh, quickly talk about the ASC since I'm down here in Dallas. To me, there's two teams that that are in the mix um, for the top 25 poll heading into this thing, and that is Mary Harden Baylor, and they return Josiah Johnson, who uh, you know coming in is a is a probable first team All American candidate. Um, when you have him, and then they return plenty of other guys. They they lost Ty Prince, who was one of their most valuable guys, but they have a whole bunch of size and talent to go along with Josiah Johnson. And uh, I guess if I had to do a uh, an ASC preseason poll right now, I'd probably pick Mary Harden Baylor. But the the team that impressed me in person last year down at that Belton uh, Regional was ETBU. East Texas Baptist, holy smokes, that Mary Harden Baylor ETBU game was much closer to a final four caliber talent game than it was, what was that, round two. Um, uh, ETBU has a lot coming back, um, including Derry Moore, who's a six, seven, freakishly athletic, skilled guy that should be one of the best big guys in, in division three. They've also added um, a ton from Juco. And so to me, I flip a coin between uh, Mary Harden Baylor and ETBU. Um, I think after that, Texas, Dallas, this will be their last year, I believe officially in, in division three. Um, they lost a ton. Kyle Pierschke uh, was such a great player for them. I don't think they're on my radar at this point. Um, so those two teams and let's finish it up, Matt Snyder, you had double duty here. Let's finish it with the league. I think we'd all agree was the best conference last year. And that is the UAA. So, so Matt, uh, it was a crazy battle last year. What do you see about the UAA this year? Yeah, we talked all year about it being the best league last season. The scary thing is most of these teams might be better this season than they were last year. It's going to be a crazy good league this year. Um, I I think what case won it last year. I think they and NYU in my mind are kind of like the two teams I would be picking up at the top. I wouldn't know which way to go. I think wash U is maybe right there. Just maybe a half a step behind them. I think that would kind of make up my top three. Um, but Emory's great too. They might be my, like my fourth team in the UAA. They're great. They had a, y- a young team last year. Uh, their top scorer, Ben Pierce, was a freshman. I think they're going to be excellent. We talked about NYU having like a couple D1 guys coming in, all their returners. We talked about Case having more transfers in. Case has a D1 guy coming in. They have five D3 transfers who are essentially starters at their schools coming into Case. Right. It, the, the talent coming into the UAA is just um, insane. I think Wash U's maybe the team there at the top that doesn't have all this big influx of transfers that I've seen. Maybe I, I've missed something at this point. Um, but they return a, a whole bunch of production from last year's top 25 team. So I think, I think Wash U is going to be going to be ter- terrific. Um, it's, it's going to be scary for the whole rest of the country. Um, I think maybe last year, the UAA missed that elite top notch team. They might have three or four like top 10 caliber teams in the UAA. Uh, and I, and I didn't mention, you know, the, the bottom half of the league from last year was like Brandeis and Carnegie Mellon and, uh, U- University of Chicago. Yeah. I think most of those teams return. Like they were so young last year, that's why we're the bottom half. They were still like top 100 type teams, and they're returning a bunch, and they're going to be all getting better. The, the whole league's going to be like a top 50 type league. It's going to be like historically good, I think, in the UAA. An example it's what be I an mentioned. Absolute bloodbath. Yeah, it, it's it going to be a bloodbath. In the example of what I mentioned earlier about the bar to get into the top 25, the fact that it took us to the end of this show to mention Emory. Like they are so talented. Um, in addition to Wash U, like Wash U has Hayden Doyle, who is a stud guard. Um, they have uh, the the six seven shooter from Barrington. I can't remember. I, I, I'm I, I'm slipping in my old age. Whoever that kid is is an absolute stud. Is that Will Gridzinski? Yes, Gridzinski from Barrington High School. They've got um, all kinds of size, and so. Um, and they have uh, what's the point guard's name? 
Uh, let's see. Really, because Chicago area kid, Yeshiva wanted them. What's that point guard? Yogi. Name? Yogi. Yogi. <laughs> I'm really slipping, guys. I could see the kids <laughs> in my head. I just the names aren't coming to me. So Wash U's going to be really good. Um, thank you guys for for doing that, and uh, uh, thank you for all your time. What I'd like to do is just a kind of where we started to go back around the room. Any final thoughts? Anything that we didn't get to? And uh, I'd like to start with Ryan Scott. Ryan, what do you have for us in kind of closing out the QCast here tonight? I don't have a lot more to say. I just um, still, what is it, 29 days away till we have some real games? I, it cannot come fast enough. I'm ready for this to get going and um, get into some games and seeing some basketball. Totally agree. We're all with you, brother. How about uh, Ryan Whitnable? No, I, I agree. Uh, this feels, you know, having done this last year, this feels like the first mile post on the on the road to getting the season underway. The next thing will be the, you know, the preseason ballots coming in and officially getting those out. Uh, and then we'll be talking about basketball, you know, in, in less than a month. So really excited to get going. Um, really excited for the, you know, that opening slate of games the first couple of weeks. I, I commend all the coaches on on the scheduling the last several years. I, it's It's really picked up. Um, and it gives us a lot to chew on, I think, early on and, and to be able to see teams in, in competitive close games. You mentioned we did this last year, and I went back and watched a lot of that in preparation for this. And I tell you what, we kind of crushed it. We we did a really good job last year of like throwing teams. If you go back and watch some of the stuff we were talking about, it was actually pretty good. I know someone's going to take pot shots at us like, hey, you didn't mention my team, but like you can't mention everyone. Um, how about uh, Mike Raniak? Mike, uh, what are your closing thoughts here? Yeah, I, I, I think just overall, like, I, I think we have a good, like, handle, I would think, on, like you said, like, the top, like, 30, 40. It's just, like, I don't know if there's that, holy smokes, this team is an unstoppable juggernaut team. I, and and that, that could I could be wrong come December, and we're like, oh, my God like Case Western hasn't lost and they're being teams by 50, like whatever. Uh, but I, I don't know if we have that on, on paper yet, which is going to be interesting. Um, I think, you know, another one that I had dark horse and I'm going to throw that, throw this out here, maybe not this year, but you know, I'm going to give shout out to my, my buddy, Aaron Toomey. I think university of Hartford could be, could be an issue in the Northeast just because of their facilities and sure. what they have kind of yeah. going on um just in the northeast there just knowing their competitors but uh, i i do believe like it's going to be a really cool um season ahead i i do think like the uaa is going to be like this year where i'm going to vote like maybe all eight of them in my <laughs> top 25 i don't know and hopefully maybe it sticks but i i do i do think um the quality and the talent is is right up there with any that I've ever seen over the last I would say you know since I've been doing this for a long time because like it's almost like the people are starting to see like exactly how good this bas the basketball division three is but I think also you know information is getting out there that much more readily and I think you know providing an avenue and um it's just crazy the amount of talent that that is returning and coming back and the COVID effects. So I'm looking forward to it. Um, I've already started to see some practices, so it's exciting for me. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to kind of seeing how, you know, once games start ch checking uh, the boxes here, we are going to get some, a lot of great easy or, or not easy, but early tests of teams, um, which I think is a credit to teams understanding, like Ryan said, how important scheduling is, especially for non-conference especially for pool C bids, um, that's going to be important. And you mentioned, you know, there, there isn't really a runaway train here. Uh, even, even though the defending champs bring basically everyone back, you know, I remember sitting in Belton at the scores table that first weekend. And if Farmingdale state closes out the game, CNU loses in round, was that round one or two round one, one. right? Round one. one. So Farmingdale state from the skyline almost beat CNU. And uh, the other thing about CNU, I'd say, is I've seen a lot of times where a team that has been together year after year after year, like you think they're just going to roll that next year and something just doesn't jive all of a sudden, whatever that thing is, you know, guys getting closer to 
being done and you know, senioritis. Well, I'm not saying that's going to happen. I'm just saying if you're looking for a reason to think that CNU isn't a runaway train, um, it's gone. A, it's gone a different way before in these kind of teams. And and who knows? Um, Zach Snyder, uh, what are your final thoughts? Yeah, I don't know that I have anything to to add. I just echo you know my excitement for the season and you know I, the level of play. I think is going to be really good. I'm excited to see it. Um, Bob, I, I appreciate you having me on. I'm a big fan of the program, so it's an honor to be able to take part. Uh, it's great to finally have you on the QCast, Zach. Appreciate all you're doing on the D3 Datacast. You guys are awesome. And how about Matt Snyder? Matt, your final thoughts? Yeah, just maybe a little different perspective on what Coach Reg just said about not having that number one top Holy Spokes team. To me, it's almost like because we have eight to 10 of those teams. Yes. Where in a lot of years, we would say like, oh, I think this team's number one for sure. And I'm almost having trouble fitting them in my top five or my top 10. I just think there's, it might be the fifth year. It might be the grad years, the grad transfers type of a thing. I don't know what it is. There's just a lot of teams I feel, I feel are really strong and a lot of, a lot of depth. Um, so I, I'm excited for those early season games that we're going to see those, those teams, you know, Christopher Newport plays a tough schedule. We got those NESCAC and UAA games that are going on early in the season. We've got Great Lakes Invitational in November. Just so many good matchups are coming up right away. And coming off of what was such a good tournament and a good Final Four last year, just picking it right up with a great November, I think is going to be super fun to watch. I agree. And uh, just I'll, go ahead, Ryan. I need to just, I don't know. I assume this is airing probably tomorrow. You're going to put it up sometime. It'll be tonight. Soon, It'll be up there tonight. John, John Hines, as you're preparing the posters for the wall that says no juggernaut, no, no top team keep my name off of that put the other guys on those quotes in the in the in the locker room and just um i'll i'll stick with cnu till they lose here okay well i mean in fact they're going to be my number one team i mean they're going to get they're going to be unanimous number one unanimous and so if they want to like print print posters they can do that if they want to put some king of bulletin board board material (laughs) that's all right um i'll just say this uh to everyone tuning in is I know, I know this came off uh, rather kind of unscripted with just going around there. These guys put a lot of work into preparing for this, and I appreciate that. This is a fun episode every year, second time we've done it. Um, it it's a blast. I do think, I do think for where how early we are here on October 10th, I, th- I think we've got a pretty good handle, much better than I expected to be at this point, on where the landscape is. Now, there's a lot of teams we didn't mention that are going to be tremendous. And you can't mention them all, so take it easy on us if you can. I uh, want to thank Matt, Zach, Ryan, Mike, and Ryan for the time tonight. want to thank everyone for tuning in. Uh, this has been the QCast Season 4, Episode for the Men's Basketball Preseason Top 25 Roundtable. Gentlemen, it's been an honor and a pleasure, and we'll see you guys soon, okay? Thanks, Bob. See you. Thank you. Good job, team. Thanks.